U.S. stocks are mixed after erasing an early slide as crude oil drops more than 3%. But the question is, what do you miss? Federal Reserve Vice Chairman Stanley Fisher lays the groundwork for what will be a closely watched speech this week by Chair Janet Yellen. And Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe makes an epic Olympic appearance as Super Mario. We discuss why his economic policies, however, may still be struggling. And we discuss what you missed in today's $14 billion deal made by Pfizer. We begin with our market minutes. A pretty um, modest move in the major indexes when all is said and done. When you look at the close here, uh, the big story really has to be oil prices. Oil declining for the first time in something like eight days, the longest winning streak yeah. in months, if not years. And of course, oil had just entered a, bear, uh, a bull market as well before it gave way to some profit taking today. The Dow closing down 22 points, and Nasdaq inching higher. Kind of some modest moves. Very yeah, cool. modest is definitely the word of the day, and it's definitely. I would argue probably the word of the month. Yeah, th there was no range at all. I actually looked to measure uh, on stocks, and I saw that half a percent was the widest range. The Nasdaq and uh, the Dow swung half a percent. The S&P only about three tenths of one percent. Take a look at my eye map. Uh, it's the most basic function to use to see how the industry groups are moving uh, throughout the day within a specific index. I've got it obviously for the S&P here, and what you can see is a totally defensive investor. Utilities, the biggest gainer, then healthcare, then consumer staples. Down at the bottom you see, of course, because of the drop in energy, uh, the oil stocks were down, and consumer discretionary stocks were down again uh, as well. So people were getting uh, defensive in today's market. Uh, on the government bond market, a uh, bond market we don't talk about that much, Indian 10-year yields jumping today on the announcement of the replacement uh, for Rajan Urjit Patel. Some nervousness in Indian markets. Always, he was, Rajan was so widely respected, yeah. so any transition of power is going to cause a little agitation. So you see a rise in uh, yields. Also saw the uh, Sensex slip. The Sensex slip. Right, let's stick with the emerging market here because I'm looking at the JP Morgan Emerging Market FX index, seeing its biggest drop in about a month, or it was a little bit earlier. It's paired some of those declines. Russian ruble leading the slide there. And of course, that up arrow is the dollar versus the ruble. That's as oil prices drop for the first time in eight days. And the Turkish lira also weakening after Fitch cut its outlook on Turkey's credit rating. Fitch saying that the failed coup attempt last month increases the political risks of investing in Turkey. Uh, and let's take a uh, and commodities gold and silver getting hit today. We see the decline silver really getting slammed uh, Perhaps some of that was the sell-off was perceived to be the hawkishness of those comments from Stanley Fisher And one commodity getting a nice bounce today was uh, natural gas So this sort of one last heat wave you can see right there a bit of a rally today after some recent selling all right, those are today's market minutes. Now let's take a deep dive into the Bloomberg, and you can find all the following charts using the function at the bottom of your screen. And I'm pulling up the heat map here for oil because we're going to stick with that idea that uh, oil prices have, have given back some of their recent gains. Again, here's the heat map, and I'm going to do it for the last five years. And what you'll notice is this column. This is September. Oil tends to drop in the month of September. For the last five years, that's been the consistent pattern. In 2015, crude oil, W. WTI dropped more than 8% in 2014, down 5% in 2013, uh, about 5%. And these are pretty sizable losses. It's not just a pullback of 1% or 2%. So an ominous warning for the uh, days ahead after this extraordinary uh, bounce back we've seen. In the yeah, the mini bull market within the larger bear market of crude oil. All right, I want to go uh, talk about the uh, stock market today because it's kind of an interesting day. If we go into the Bloomberg and look at an intraday chart, you see it was really jerky. Like, look at these moves. We saw at 10 I love this chart by the way so how, did, how did you do this and then boom and then boom and then boom just these like really sharp ups and downs and then on the left side you see you see this is a volume distribution so this is the volume analysis function and you can see all the volume was uh, really concentrated at a few prices basically here here and a little bit here yeah. It's kind of an ugly annotation, but you get the point. There were just a few prices, and then you had these big gaps where there was almost no volume at all. And so it was kind of this jerky, slow summer day. Ultimately, not much change, but the, the changes that did happen happened at no volume and very fast. So I'm going to have to see one. how you did that volume distribution. Yeah, I'll show you. That. It's a fun one. On the Matt's, left. Matt has chart envy right now. I put, I do. Well, you know what? I have a great chart that I stole from someone else. So Oliver Rennick put this chart together. It's 29.26. 
in the BTV library. And what it shows you is company spending on R&D, uh, capital expenditures, and profit margins. R&D is the red column. And you can see that spending on R&D has gotten bigger each quarter. This is quarterly going back to uh, the beginning of 2014. Um, and that capital expenditures have dropped to almost nil. Now, we know that capital expenditures are probably because uh, companies mm. have little confidence in the uh, economic future, but the R&D expenditures growing, I thought was very interesting. May have something to do with the tax uh, treatment on R&D. I'm not 100% sure, hmm. but it looks like they've been putting more into that. Profit margins, though they got bigger over the first couple of years in this chart, they are starting to shrink a little bit. So a lot of, uh, a, a lot of pressure on profit margins lead CEOs to cut back on capital expenditures, but they're still growing R&D spending, which is very interesting. By the way, that chart I showed earlier for Bloomberg users, IGPV, the uh, volume and analysis fund. Oh, very so cool. So you can make your own chart that has that sideways volume. Matt is writing oh, it down cool. as we speak. All right, one thing that jumped out to our next guest is the move higher in LIBOR. And there's been some concern, or at least people noticing, uh, the recent surge in the spread between mm. LIBOR and the U.S. Treasury bill, the three-month bill. With us now is Bob Cinch, global strategist at Amherst Pierpont Securities. And Bob, whenever anyone talks about LIBOR, what comes out right away is that this is anticipation before the money market reform kicks in. Yet, when you look at that spread widen, why are people taking a second look at it and wondering if this could be something that could get concerning. You know, I think whenever you see spreads between bank-oriented paper, which is what LIBOR really is, and Treasury bills, uh, you hearken back to the, uh, to the 2007, yeah. 8, 9 financial crisis. Is there some sort of risk brewing up that we're not aware of uh, and concerns that that's what the market is beginning to tell us? I think in this case, it's something much more innocuous, and that is uh, in mid-October, October 14th, there's a major reform going on for money market fund, the money market fund industry, uh, which is basically creating more volatility in the net asset value, particularly for institutional funds, and also some, uh, some gates that basically slow down redemptions and charge redemption fees in case there's a run on the money market funds. This is a designed to improve liquidity. What it's led to is a lot of companies, uh, major brokerage firms, retail-oriented, requiring their customers to shift out of what would be called a prime money market fund, which would include CDs, commercial paper, LIBOR-based products, and move instead into government-only funds. Now you can see on the chart. So the question is that I see is, sure, there may be a d uh, benign explanation for this shift, but will it have economic ramifications? There are loans and other things tied to LIBOR. So even if there is a benign explanation, will it filter through into the real economy in a negative way? <clears throat> well, the question is order of magnitude, right? I mean, you've had a $400 billion shift from prime money market funds to uh, government funds. Right. As a result, the demand for T-bills has gone up, the demand for LIBOR-based product has gone down, the spread has widened. So the spread has widened out about 30 basis points. The question is, is that because LIBOR went up 30 basis points or T-bills went down by 30 basis points or is it some combination of the two? My guess is it's some combination of the two um, that maybe LIBOR is, is, is overstated where it might normally be if this weren't the case by say 10 to 15 basis points. I can't believe 10 to 15 basis points is really gonna have a macro effect uh, anywhere uh, in, uh, in the economy. So uh, I think it's small, but again, I think sometimes you just read simplistic measures like this widening spread and say, oh, there's something, you know, there's something bad happening out there. There's liquidity constraints in the economy. Uh, in fact, I think this one is very easily explained by a reform process. But, Bob, why do you think, I mean, I find the, the shift from prime money market funds into government uh, debt instruments the most interesting. Is that because they're getting into uh, government funds, or is that because they're getting out of prime money market funds? I, I mean, the latter could be because of some changes in the way they're regulated, some changes in the way they operate. Maybe investors have... Uh, less trust in prime money market funds than they had in the past? Uh, I think it's both. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think it's really uh, not a choice factor. My brokerage account at a, at a major discount firm required me to take my sweep account from my brokerage account from a prime fund to a government fund. All the big broker, retail brokerage funds have required their customers to do that. So this was not a choice variable. This was required. It's been happening over the last couple of months. 
And $400 billion is a lot of money to shift from prime funds to, sure. to government funds. Luckily, T-bill issuance is creeping higher. That's going to help some of these government funds get more assets uh, to invest in. Uh, but I do think this is a regulatory issue. Um, and, and again, it's not that individuals are making a conscious decision. I received a notice saying we're switching your, your sweep account. You, can you see, have no choice. Bring the, bring the chart back up. You can see that the regulation went into effect on December in 2015 because there's a drop in prime money market funds right there and a coinciding jump in government funds. So if the reason for all of this is benign um, and it's not really a good metric or a good indicator of liquidity, what would you look at to get any sense of a liquidity crunch if, we're not, if we can't use this metric? Well, there are other uh, uh, three-month markets other than Treasury bills. You can look at commercial paper. Mm -hmm. um, you can look at international uh, dollar markets. The spread between LIBOR and commercial paper rates is unchanged this year. It's three basis points uh, through commercial paper. So basically, the other markets that might show some change relationship to LIBOR, in fact, haven't done that at all. Uh, and in that context, it tells me that this is really, more than anything else, a, a big demand for T-bills, which is artificially depressed T-bill rates, and maybe pushed up these other rates as all these prime money market funds, the big buyers have been forced to liquidate some positions. But what's interesting also is that the market tends to equalize itself. And so individual companies seeing money market funds having to dump their LIBOR and commercial paper assets, see those rates go up a little bit, the companies have probably been taking money out of funds and putting them directly into that paper because they can get a better yield on it. So, so I think the market is working. And in fact, given a $400 billion shift, I think the spread widening is actually pretty small. Let me ask you quickly about currencies. When I hear your name, I think about currencies for some reason. Uh, the pound, you, you sent us a chart about the short positioning in the pound, and uh, there are 94,000 contracts, short contracts open in the pound. What do you think about this uh, positioning right now, and what can it mean for moves going forward? Uh, I think it's a painful, potentially a painful position. We've seen the data not come in all that bad. We've seen the pound actually perk up a bit in the last couple of days. The trade-weighted pound was down about 7% before the Brexit vote, down another 7 or 8% afterwards. The trade-weighted pound is down 15% this year. That's a massive easing of monetary conditions. I think the currency now is probably getting into an undervalued territory. And, and let me tell you, HSBC was out uh, last week with a call for mm -hmm. pound euro parity and a dollar ten. Yeah, I mean, and that's <clears throat> outlier, but still. I've, I've seen that. Um, I would tend not to disagree. I, I, I would tend to disagree. I think 130 is probably the low level, and we could see some squeeze higher in the near term. All right, Bob Cinch, the global strategist at Amherst Pierpont Securities, thank you very much for coming in. Coming up, Pfizer is buying Medivation for $14 billion, one of the big M&A stories of this Monday. Medivation soaring, obviously, on the news, and Santa Fe is licking its wounds. Can we expect more M&A in this space, or should we just assume yes and then ask, what are the targets? This is Bloomberg.
I'm Mark Crumpton. Let's get to First Word News. A federal judge in Texas has blocked the Obama administration's order requiring public schools to let transgender students use bathrooms and locker rooms consistent with their chosen gender identity. The ruling applies nationwide. Judge Reed O'Connor said federal officials failed to follow rules requiring an opportunity for comment before such directives are issued. Congressional Republicans have issued subpoenas to three technology companies. They either made or provided maintenance for the private email server that Hillary Clinton used while Secretary of State. The GOP has been stepping up attacks on Mrs. Clinton's handling of sensitive government information that flowed through the server located in the basement of her New York home. Mrs. Clinton leads Donald Trump in the latest poll out of Ohio. She has a four-point lead in the latest Monmouth University survey. The lead is just within the margin of error, but consistent with recent surveys, showing her ahead by the mid-single digits. Former French President Nicolas Sarkozy wants his old job back. Sarkozy has formally announced he's running for president. His Republican Party holds its primaries in November. Sarkozy led France from 2007 to 2012. He's urged a tougher stance against terrorism. Current President Francois Hollande has been sinking in the polls. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Scarlett, back to you. Thanks so much, Mark. What'd you miss? Pfizer is buying Medivation for a price tag of $14 billion. This deal gives Pfizer the blockbuster prostate cancer treatment and leaves Sanofi, who is also bidding for Medivation, in the dust. So where can the Paris-based company go to use all that M&A cash? Joining us now is Jeff McCracken, Bloomberg's executive editor of Global Deals. So let's put this into perspective first. Uh, Pfizer is buying Medivation. What exactly is the appeal of Medivation? So it's all about cancer. This has been a hot year. Actually, even going back to last year, it's been a hot time to buy oncology drugs. They already have a prostate cancer drug. They're trying to develop a breast cancer drug and a blood cancer drug, a lymphoma, I believe it's called. So you've got current assets that are, you know, going to throw off cash right now, and you've got something coming over the next couple of years that have value. So that's what everyone was after. That's what Sanofi was after. But Sanofi really laid an egg here. I mean, they started this process back in March. They played it badly. I'm sure there are a lot of difficult conversations going on right now between Sanofi and their two ban their bankers at Morgan Stanley and Goldman because they never saw this company ever being worth $14 billion. I think more of a guess than anything. I think they assumed it was like a $10 billion, $12 billion at most. That's uh, a huge company. difference. Absolutely. Way, way off. They, and they were advised way back to bump their bid because they started out at $52 and then pushed to 58 and this ended up selling for 81 So they never really got all that close from what we know. Well, is it possible that Pfizer then could end up with the, uh, the winner's curse here where maybe they were right not to go this high and Pfizer down the road? What are people saying? Is it possible? That you know, what pay? people are really saying is Pfizer is so much bigger than Sanofi that they don't have to to, if they do an okay job in, in merging this, that'll be fine. I mean, they're a $220, $212 billion market cap company. This is a deal that they can do easily. Um, in fact, what probably upsets a lot of the uh, biotech and pharma companies out that they would compete with is the fact that they didn't do the Allergan deal, which would have spent a lot of their time and a lot of energy and a lot of money. But that deal fell apart, so they've got a lot of money that they can do this deal. I mean, Sanofi in three to six months could look at other companies like, we've mentioned names like Biomarin or Insight as possible takeover candidates. But would it surprise anyone if Pfizer came in and also bought that? I mean, they're almost like what Valiant used to be two years ago when Valiant had money and a reputation. They were literally in every auction that existed. Now, I know that uh, over on the deals desk, you and Alex Sherman and Ed Hammond, Alex Barinka have a pool. Which company is going to go next, right? A target pool. Are they all cancer drug companies right there lined up at the top of that pool? So actually, we do not have that pool, but I will. Yeah, that'd be great if <laughs> every, everyone thought so. Um, I think Biomarin, and I mentioned this, I've mentioned this earlier, that's a company that's been out there forever. Their name is well known by the arbitrage community, by the M&A reporters, the M&A bankers, lawyers, et cetera. They're one that fits. I think roughly market cap's around $15 billion, so they would fetch 20 20 something, maybe even 30 something billion. That's right. one I to keep an 16, eye on. Six, I see him almost 17 billion today because you can see Biomarin Pharmaceuticals up almost 7%. Insights trading at about $16 billion and, market and cap today. Tessero is probably 5 to 6 billion market cap last I checked. That's another one to keep an eye on. It fits in. It's in that realm of an easier to do deal if you're Sanofi. I mean, we should also keep an eye on Celgene and Amgen and Gilead. All much those bigger, guys. Much bigger companies though. Celgene's an $80 billion company. Right, exactly. But they're all looking to do deals in this size, in this space.
So when it comes to health care, it seems like there's a bit of a ramp up in the deal making right now. Is this usual? Is this typical for there to be so much deal making in the late summer months before we head into what traditionally is a busier period? of? Yeah, the I, I of made the, the mistake of trying to schedule vacations in August, and I, I will try not to do that again because I thought it was going to be really slow this month. But between this deal and the, you know, forced the Praxair deals, the, the gas deals and what's going on with ChemChina and Syngenta, just in general, it feels like it's picking up. Some of it might be the election. People are trying to get things done done when they have uh, a sense of what's what the administration looks like now and what the struggles are going to be. And again, you can borrow so cheaply. Right. Investors are generally w rewarding companies that are doing deals. I think Sanofi f was off today because their investors expected they would get this deal done. So the, the environment, if you will, is still very supportive of big acquisitions. Um, uh, you, you led us perfectly into Asian buyers with U.S. or European targets, right? ChemChina, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, targeting a European company, but Japanese buyers are looking for U.S. companies, I would assume, as well, because of yen strength. And we know that Nomura is even hiring, like, a dozen or 20 bankers because they think M&A and IPOs are just going to pick up. Right, and that's going on at the same time at places like Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse and Barclays are getting rid of bankers or not bringing the M&A bankers back or resigning them. Uh, in general, if you're in China or you're in Japan, the U.S. is the best place to try to add business. I mean, even at the not even at you know 1.2 percent GDP growth in a quarter, which makes everyone here wring their hands and get upset. That's still tremendous when you look at the base of what our GDP is. So every other company would love to have more business in the United States, especially if you're an Asian company. By the way, before we wrap it up, let me just point you at MA Go. I've got it drawn out to 12 years. Uh, looking at um, the deals here in blue. Uh, we hit a record last year as far as the value of and the number of deals, right? This is a quarterly breakdown. Correct. If I switch it to annual, then it's easier to see. Record last year. Are we going to get to another record this year? I don't think so. I mean, the records we're going to see are Asian outbound deals, Asian outbound deals into the United States or into Europe. Um, Chem China Syngenta is a perfect example of that. I don't think we're going to have a record year. We'll hit three trillion ish, but I don't anticipate a deal. I could be wrong, but I don't anticipate the, the next four months being anything like last year. All right, Jeff McCracken, Bloomberg's executive editor of Global Deals. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Coming up, have you ever wondered how relevant fiscal versus monetary stimulus was 20 years ago? We'll show you a snapshot of that data. This is Bloomberg.
you missed, let's take a deep dive now into the Bloomberg because, as you know, Joe and Matt, uh, fiscal stimulus is really gaining currency as a prescription for boosting global economic growth oh. because we're at the limits of what monetary policy can achieve. So this is NTGO on the Bloomberg, and this chart goes back to 1990. What I've done here is graph how often the words fiscal stimulus shows up in news stories. That is the white line versus the frequency that the words monetary stimulus appears, and that is the orange line. And it's pretty notable here that fiscal stimulus, the white line, shows up much more frequently than monetary stimulus. The heyday of monetary stimulus, as you might expect, was right after the financial crisis from, let's say, 2010, really peaking in 2012, and coming back down again. It's gotten some play lately, but that's because most of the articles are about the limitations of it. I think that's such a fascinating chart for s multiple reasons. I mean, one, you see that big surge at the very end as everyone starts talking about fiscal stimulus again. Yep. That's really the zeitgeist right now. And also at the end of the financial crisis here, uh, or at the start of the financial crisis. Right, with the uh, with the Recovery Act. That's and then right. it went into, uh, and then it went into um, this dormant period. dormancy, and then it was all monetary. So it's a great chart. I love this chart. And that news trends function is just one of the best functions on the terminal, in my opinion, for really understanding how the conversation of anything shifts. Well, you can time. work so, uh, you can do so many different things with yeah. it. It's incredibly uh, uh, variable. I just wanted to show the 10 year, so the 10 year right now um, is yielding 1.54%. And I just have a simple uh, yield graph of it, but if you do GC go on the 10 year, you can do it with any, uh, any uh, dead instrument. Um, you can graph the curve here, and then you can look at it uh, over a week, and it'll show you down on the second uh -huh. panel um, the changes mm. in yield over the different 10 years. Let me go ahead and get rid of this uh, over here. So what we can see from this is that at the beginning, at the short end of the curve, uh, the yields have gone up on three months, six months, one year. We're looking at a four basis point gain on one year debt here, whereas on the long end of the curve over the last week, yields have come down, and the 30 year uh, has come down four and a half basis points. What this basically shows you is that there is curve flattening going on flattening. a lot of this this one week move thanks to Stanley Fisher that is very cool because you don't think about that when you're just quoting what the it's just a does. cool way to look at yields over ten, over 10 years I mean I like GC obviously 3d but all right coming up our next guest explains why Aminomics will never work but actually Japan will be fine in the long run so what happens in the interim this is Bloomberg
front and let's get to Bloomberg's first word news. The U.S. State Department says it's reviewing nearly 15,000 previously undisclosed emails recovered from Hillary Clinton's private home server. The first batch should be released in mid-October. That raises the prospect they could become public just before November's presidential election. Illinois Senator Mark Kurt says he'll hold a hearing in September on the Obama administration's delivery of $400 million in cash to Iran. Republicans have criticized the administration since it admitted the repayment of the money from a 1970s Iranian account was connected to a U.S.-Iranian prisoner exchange. The administration denies the money was, quote, ransom. Turkish President Recep Erdogan is complaining about the U.S. delay in extraditing an Islamic cleric accused of masterminding last month's failed military coup. President Erdogan says the U.S. position on Fethullah Gulen is overshadowing the country's strategic partnership. He plans to discuss the situation with Vice President Biden, who is scheduled to arrive in Turkey on Thursday. The U.S. has said it needs evidence that Gulen did something criminal. Russia will quit using bases in Iran to launch airstrikes on Syrian rebels, at least for now. That's according to Iran's foreign ministry. The Russians began the attacks last week. Earlier today, Iran's defense minister criticized Russia for announcing it was using Iranian bases, calling it, quote, kind of show-off and ungentlemanly. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Scarlett, back to you. Thank you so much, Mark. Let's get a recap of today's market action. Not a whole lot going on when it comes to equities. We did see equities drifting around, and for the Dow and the S&P, it was a down day. The Nasdaq closing marginally higher, but in terms of other asset classes, traders pushed up the dollar and pushed commodities down because uh, Stan Fisher, the Fed vice chair, uh, basically suggested that another rate increase this year, or a rate, rate increase since we haven't had one since last December, would be appropriate. Uh, and interestingly, 10-year yields, despite the talk of higher rates falling, so as Matt pointed out before, we saw a little bit of increased rates on the low end, the short end, lower on the 10-year. Uh, ten uh, oil giving up its um, falling for the first time in eight days. It had been on a seven-day winning streak, which, which was its longest streak since 2012, so some give back there. I thought, yeah, it's longest streak uh, in four years, basically. Yeah, pretty remarkable. So Down uh, big, 3%. Big drop. But oil, I mean, I showed a chart earlier. And you know what? I'll just bring it up again. Uh, G hashtag BTV, I believe it was 2833. Julie put this together. Julie Hyman, our stocks reporter. But it just shows you the wild ride that oil has had uh, back to 2015. Yeah. We fell 47% that year through February. Then we were up 95%, so doubling in 2016 at the beginning then back into a bear market, then back into a bull market on Friday, but because of today's uh, drop, only up 19%. Now, what'd you miss? There's a sophisticated... Should I, Hi again. Can I do that Hi again? again. Yeah. What'd you miss? There's a sufficient chance the Bank of Japan will add to its unprecedented easing at September's policy meeting. The yen weekend after BOJ Governor Kuroda made that comment. This is all set against the backdrop of Japanese Prime Minister Abe's recent uh, plans for more aggressive stimulus. In a recent Bloomberg View column, our next guest said that the second round of Abenomics will be dead before arrival. Joining us now is Chen Zhao, uh, co-director of Macro Research at Brandywine Global Investment Management. Chen, thanks for joining us uh, last night. Uh, Abe was one of the stars of the uh, closing Olympic ceremonies in Rio. Joe pointed out this morning, I had not seen this yet. He was dressed as Super Mario. Um, <laughs> he's holding up a big gold coin there for a second. What does this mean? Is it some somehow symbolizing things to come? <laughs> I hope it's not symbolizing the monetary reflation. I, I don't think it's going to work. It's going to be very, uh, it's going to be very difficult for him to face the, the Japanese after uh, another round of monetary reflation, because really, as I said, it's a dead before the arrival. So what's next for the Bank of Japan? Um, they've hinted at more stimulus at the last meeting. There was talk about reevaluating the framework. You don't think it's going to work, but what do you think they're going to try, and what do you think they should do instead? 
I think really they are they are really aiming at a wrong target because if you think about the Japanese economic problem, it's really not a productivity problem. If you think about any economy, uh, economic growth basically is productivity growth plus labor force growth. And if you look at the Jap Japan's productivity growth, it has been at par with the United States for the last 20, 30 years. The only thing that has has explained the Japanese relative shrinkage in GDP relative to the rest of the world has been the labor force. So I, as far as I understand, that Abenomics has has not has has done nothing to address that problem. Well, so that's why I think it's not going to be resolving any problem at all. So take us back a little bit here, because at one time Japan was dominant globally um, in, in economics. Totally. How is it that Japan came to dominate global economics in the 1980s? Was it a special confluence of uh, demographics and technological shock that created that moment, and or, or was it an anomaly? I think the, uh, the 1980s, there was a, a combination of things. One is that Japan is really at the young stage of industrialization. It was very export-driven at the time. Uh, the world economy was just came out of a very deep recession. Japan was really uh, able to capitalize, capitalize on that opportunities. That's why if you look at Japan's productivity growth during that period, it was very, very high. And at the same time, they do have a positive labor force growth. And it seems the two th things are 19, I would think pretty much since the early 90s, that dynamics has completely changed. The labor productivity has been reasonably okay, has been at par with the U.S., don't get me wrong. The problem here is that the, the Japanese uh, labor force has, has started to shrink. If you look at Japan's, uh, another data is really interesting. If you look at Japan's uh, the economy, GDP, the U.S. has outgrown Japan by 25 percent in terms of the size of GDP since 1990. And that outgrowth has been entirely, absolutely explained by the relative labor force, not productivity. That's what I'm saying. If Japan does not have productivity problem, it means that the Japanese standard of living has been increasing along with productivity growth. Don't forget that productivity growth is per capita GDP growth. That's what I'm saying for the last 20, 30 years, the standard of living for, for the average Japanese has been increasing along with that of the United States. It's just less and less people are producing goods and services. That's why you have a stagnating economy. It's not a solvable problem unless the Japanese government is waiting to allow a lot of immigrants to come into the country. Otherwise, you cannot solve that Do, problem. End of the story. Does the problem need to be solved? No, I don't think so. I think it's a Japanese own choice. It's the government's choice. It does not have to be uh, resolved. I don't think there's a problem because Japan is not like other country that is not productive. Japan is as productive as that of the United States. Don't get me wrong. So the Japanese living standard is increasing at the same speed as the United States. So there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that matured, advanced economy. But the only problem here is Japan has run a very restrictive immigration policy. Mm -hmm. That really, uh, that's really uh, undercut its labor force growth, and that has really allowed its uh, natural demographic trend to play itself out. Whereas the U.S., we, have, we always have immigrants. Right. We always have new labor force growth. So that's what makes the difference. So it, it sounds like, and you mentioned this in your column, that Japan would become the equivalent of a Nordic country, a prosperous country, high accumulative wealth, uh, affluent population, somewhat insular, with a more limited impact on the world economy. Is that okay with the totally. Japanese government? Is that priced into Japanese assets? I think if you think about the UK history, it's a bit of a like Japan. I mean, UK used to dominate, used to dominate the whole world. Right now, if you look at the UK economy, it is still a very affluent economy, but it's an island economy. That is, you know, Japan. It's it's like Japan. Japan used to dominate the world economy in the 80s. The size of the Japanese economy, the size of the Japanese economy was way too big at the time. Of the bubble collapsed. And I think the natural process basically put Japan on the path of returning to its natural equilibrium. I think eventually Japan will become another UK, or of course, a slightly big, bigger than UK because Japan has a bigger population, but it's an island economy nonetheless. I don't think it, it you know, that's, that, that's anything wrong with that.
So if, uh, if we go into the Bloomberg, I mean, you can take a look at the uh, Japanese unemployment rate, and this is a problem that every country in the world would love to have. It's at its lowest level since 1995 totally. at 3.1%. So if you say there's nothing underlying wrong the Japanese economy, then what do you see as Shinzo Abe? What's he, tr what's he playing at? Well, I think the, uh, I personally don't think that they really think about their economic problem very deeply. Even us as an economist don't think about the problem very deeply because simply we look at the statistics and say Japan has been stagnating for decades. That's something wrong because everybody else is growing. Well, wait a minute. You have to really look into deeper. You have to really look into the cause, causes of why this stagnation has taken place in the first place. So I think that the Abenomics basically, I think Singjo Abe is addressing this very popular observation that Japan has stagnated for years without really thinking through what he's doing. I'm, I'm looking at so, a similar chart, by the way, Chen, uh, a misery index, which is inflation plus unemployment. Very low. Uh, Japan in white here, much lower than the U.S., and it has come totally. down. But you do talk about the fact that they could grow their GDP productivity and output, accepting immigration. Is there, are there immigrants waiting to go into Japan, and would they be receptive of that? Uh, I, I think it's very difficult. I think Japan's culture is that it's not very tall. Well, I won't use the tolerant that word. I think Japan's is not very likely to uh, to accept a lot of uh, different people. You don't see a lot of different people in Japan. Japan Japanese are Japanese. They don't like uh, to uh, see a lot of uh, other people that mix around with them. So you know that's your, that's your culture. I respect that. But I think you know from an economic point of view, that is a problem to grow the size of that economy, even though they can still do something to really increase their productivity growth. We all understand that Japan has a very competitive export sector, whereas domestic sec sector is not that uh, competitive at all. So Abenomics can address that. Why don't you open up the economy a little bit more? Japan is not run a very open uh, economy. I mean, if you look at the import penetration in Japan, it's very low. So Japan can do something about that in terms of, in terms of boosting productivity. And there is still room for Japan to increase productivity somewhat. But in terms of the overall dynamics, I do not think that they can change things very much, except that they, they, they are waiting, unless they are waiting to really change the immigration policy. All right. Fascinating perspective. Thank you much, Chen Zhao of Brandywine Global. Coming up, Donald Trump is calling for the Clinton Foundation to be shut down immediately. This is Bloomberg.
What do you miss? Donald Trump is calling for the Clinton Foundation to shut down immediately as questions about the philanthropy continue to plague Hillary Clinton and her run for the White House. Trump said in a statement the Clintons have spent decades as insiders lining their own pockets and taking care of donors instead of the American people. It is now clear that the Clinton Foundation is the most corrupt enterprise in political history. Bill Clinton just sent a letter to foundation members outlining the changes that if Hillary Clinton is elected, which include barring foreign and corporate donations, and he even said that he would step down from the board. For more now, let's bring in Bloomberg News' Alex Wayne from Washington. So uh, Donald Trump not the only one as well. You also have Clinton allies like Ed Rendell, the former governor of Pennsylvania, saying that the Clinton Foundation should be limiting what it does now immediately. Yeah, I don't think that Donald Trump is wrong necessarily on this point. Uh, the Clinton Foundation is kind of a political albatross uh, for Hillary Clinton, and I think shutting it down would benefit her. Actually, there's there are there are lots of insinuations. They aren't uh, they are not ungrounded that uh, donors have used the Clinton Foundation to buy access to the Clintons themselves. Uh, this seems like a potentially good topic for Donald Trump to hammer on, but then this morning he started tweeting attacks at MSNBC hosts. <laughs> Is this his problem that even when he has something to to uh, go with, that he just dis every he gives the media something else to focus? He's easily on? distracted. E easily distracted. <laughs> I understand. I thought this was—I thought this was the thing that his uh, his new staffers are supposed to solve. <laughs> They're supposed to keep him on message, right? It's, it's, it's already we're, we're one day after the the shakeup, and and already he's he's uh, he can't he can't uh, lose his grip on his Twitter account. I, you know, we were talking uh, last week about the Clintons' tax returns, and uh, you know they earned over ten million dollars. They gave ten percent of it to charity, which looks great. But then reports started popping up that. The charity that they were giving most of that money to was yeah. their own foundation. Have you heard sure. those reports? Are they floating around Washington? Because that doesn't really sound right. Well, yeah, but I, I think it's kind of an, an unfair characterization because the, the foundation, uh, donors may use the foundation to get to the Clintons, but it's not like the foundation is. Uh, only benefits the Clintons. The foundation doesn't really benefit the Clintons at all. It gives all of its money to actual programs. It does a lot of good work in Africa, for example. Uh, it's it's not some sort of slush fund for for Bill and Hillary Clinton. So if they give money to the foundation, that money is is presumably going to good causes. You can you can look at the foundation's tax returns and see where they put well, their that's, money. That's an interesting point, Alex, and something I've been wondering about because you're seeing yeah. wealthy people give more money to foundations. We hear about the Zuckerberg. They're going to give, you know, 99% of their wealth to the foundation. And a lot of people accuse the Clintons of, uh, or they seem to accuse the Clintons of somehow having control of this money and then benefiting from control of the money in that foundation. So you're not, you're not concerned that they would benefit from the money in the foundation. No. So no, I, I, they, they've made plenty of money on, on speaking fees. I don't, they don't, they don't need to draw a salary from the foundation, and they don't. Neither one of them are, are paid by the salary, or, excuse me, by the foundation. I don't think Chelsea Clinton is either. So the, the, found, the problem with the foundation is that donors can use it to access the Clintons. The problem is not that the foundation is doing bad things or is somehow secretly funneling money back to right. the Clinton family. So to what extent, Alex, is Hillary Clinton even involved in the Clinton Foundation? I mean, she was Secretary of State. Clearly, she kept the foundation at an arm's length distance. But what happened since Did she? then? Did she? Maybe that, that <laughs> might be the right question. You know, there's, there's, there are emails from, from the State Department that show people at the foundation trying to get access on behalf of donors to State Department officials. Uh, and, it's, and it's not clear from those emails that Hillary, Hillary Clinton ever really got involved in that. Uh, and, and at least in one of those exchanges that I can recall, uh, one of Hillary Clinton's staffers actually said no to a request from the foundation. So the foundation, like, the foundation made lots of asks of the State Department under Hillary Clinton. I don't think they always got yes for an answer. All right, Bloomberg's Alex Wayne in Washington. Thank you very much. Coming up, sure. Viacom's second biggest voting shareholder, Gamco CEO Mario Gabelli, speaks to us on why he is willing to give Viacom's interim CEO, Tom Dooley, a chance. This is Bloomberg.
Scarlett Fu, which miss deciding how to reboot Paramount Pictures will be one of the first big tasks awaiting interim CEO Tom Dooley and Viacom's newly composed board. Bloomberg's Betty Lou sat down exclusively with Viacom's second biggest voting shareholder behind billionaire Summer Redstone, and that would be Gamco and Gamco CEO Mario Gabelli. Gabelli says he is willing to give Tom Dooley a chance. Well, you've got 15 new directors on. It's not costing my clients any incremental money because he's got a contract in place which has a parachute. He's got until September 30th. That's the end of the fiscal year. Why would anybody in their right mind want to change the CEO, CFO, and the uh, C uh, chief operating officer all at once when you don't have to? So if you read between the lines, guys, I mean, yes, uh, he's got until September 30th into the fiscal year, but... Uh, you can't do very much, right, in the next month. It's really, you know, what time frame does he really have to get something done? And Mario had said earlier that it looked like, that, you know, that he had wanted Domon to leave uh, six to eight months ago. And so th that seemed to be a good time frame to see whether he was really going to be able to pull something out of the hat. And, uh, it, and so it seems as if Dooley might have that, that amount of time as well. Funny thing that Mario said which is true. Ben Hur, did anybody watch that movie? No. It did terribly. Awful movie from Paramount, right? So he said, it wasn't Ben Hur. Did they it's remake Ben Hur? I didn't even. They remade Ben Hur. Morgan yeah. Freeman. Yeah, Morgan Freeman stars in it. So that's so that that's that is a, a good metaphor for 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 what's what's wrong at, at Viacom right now and what needs to be done. To what extent was um, Mario Gabelli unhappy with how Viacom was being managed even before this change with Sumner Redstone and Philippe Domon getting to, into their, their big argument? Right. I mean, remember that, you know, for so long it was uh, it was Redstone and Domon together. I mean, yes. they were a team for so long. He groomed right? him. He groomed him. I mean, you know, this was the man who, who, who we thought we it appeared would be making some final decisions for Sumner Redstone and how quickly he has fallen from grace. Um, you know, Mario has seen the shares of this company underperform significantly, uh, said that Shari Redstone was brilliant in her moves and what she did to, to essentially oust him and, and his executives. Uh, and we look towards the future now, right? So, so what is going to happen with Viacom? Is it gonna stay as a standalone company or might it come back together with CBS? Not too long ago, we broke the two companies up, right? Now we might bring them back together again. So I want you to hear what he said about who might, if Dooley can't get the job done, who might? Les has everything going on. Like, let's assume that you combine CBS with Viacom. Les Mundus, you give him an extra $50 million a year as compensation. I don't want to put a ceiling on it. But just as a number, you get a lot of synergies. You're going to talk about a company in three years. He's got to combine. You'd have $20 billion of EBITDA. You basically have one owner that controls both, so there's no takeover premium necessary. Very aware, by the way, that Les Moonves is, I believe, the highest paid or one of the highest paid CEOs. But there's no in reason to put a ceiling on it. No, I like that no. Mario pointed out. <laughs> we give him maybe we give him an extra fifty million dollars a year because it's extra work, right? He'd have to then <laughs> run both companies. Probably he'd have to be in more cities, more private plane time, you know, more speeches. But I, don't really put a ceiling, give, but I don't want to put a ceiling on it. Look, Les, clearly, if there if there was any sort of uh, any kind of visual you could have on who has done the best job. I mean, look at the stock price of CBS, look at the stock price of Viacom, and this is why people say, you know, uh, perhaps Les Moonves can now make his move and, and, and combine the two companies. I'm just looking at Paygo, which is a great function on the Bloomberg terminal. He's the 25th highest paid uh, CEO. His awarded pay was $46 million, but maybe $96 million if this happens, but no ceiling. <laughs> Betty, thank you so much. You can catch her show uh, with Yvonne Mann at 7 p.m. New York time, 7 a.m. Hong Kong, Hong Kong time. Uh, Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. You can also watch it on the Bloomberg. All right, coming up, what you need to know to gear for tomorrow's trading day. This is Bloomberg.
Don't miss this. We're going to have Eurozone manufacturing PMI and service PMI and consumer confidence all out at 3 a.m. this tomorrow morning. Should be an interesting day. Also, Best Buy earnings coming out at 7 a.m. A good look at the retailers. Don't miss that. When was the last time you stepped foot in Best Buy? All right, and at 10 a.m., U.S. new home sales for July due out. We're looking for a drop of 2% for the month of July uh, after a 3.5% gain in the month of June. That does it for what you missed. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening. This, this is, is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. I'm Alex Wagner. And I'm John Heilman. And with all due respect to Donald Trump, I believe we said you needed an, we, you needed an adult in the room. An adult. And in one of the most critical counties in this year's election cycle, a 12-year-old boy is in charge of Trump's campaign. Some people say. As they, as they say. <laughs> Uh, we have a heavy dose of TBD on our show tonight, including the influxiness of Donald Trump's immigration plan. But first, we're going to talk about Clinton World, which is dealing with the uncertainty of some 15,000 emails that the FBI uncovered while investigating Hillary Clinton's home email server. It is unclear exactly what is in those documents, but the conservative group Judicial Watch has sued to make them public, and a federal judge today gave the State Department until September 22nd to come up with a new plan to release them. Also in limbo... Bill Clinton's position on the board of his family foundation. The former president today formally announced that he will step down and cease fundraising for the organization if his wife reaches the White House. Both of these stories are central to the semi-hemi-demi new, newly disciplined Trump campaign, which is trying to refocus in a concerted way on Hillary Clinton's pressure points. As seen today, when the Republican nominee called into Fox News and called for the complete abolishment or abolition of the Clinton Foundation. Number one, they should shut it down. Number two, they should give the money back to a lot of countries that we shouldn't be taking and they shouldn't be taking money from. Countries that influenced her totally. And also countries that discriminate against women and gays and everybody else. I mean, that money should be go It should be given back. They should not take that money. And it's pay for play. I mean, if you look at it, it's pay for play. Besides the Clinton Foundation and Hillary Clinton's emails, the Democratic nominee has been facing ongoing scrutiny of her longtime aide, Huma Abedin, who the New York Post re is reporting, was for many years the assistant editor of a Muslim affairs journal that advocated for positions contrary to those Clinton has talked about for decades. Meanwhile, it's been more than 260 days and counting since Hillary Clinton held a proper press conference and at the same time breaking from long, long history of campaign decorum. She's now not allowing reporters to be inside her campaign fundraisers. So there's some transparency things going on there. Alex, um, welcome. Thank you, John. And first of all, I want to say I've been on vacation for two weeks, so please be gentle with me today. <laughs> Aren't I always? I'm barely capable of speaking in anything resembling coherent English. But the question <laughs> I have for you is the Clinton campaign today for sure is on defense on a whole bunch of different yeah. fronts. So of the various 
areas where they're on defense, where are they most politically vulnerable? Okay, let's just break it down one by one. One, I think not having a press conference matters exactly, not at all, to anybody other than the media. Um, and, and now, and I'm all for transparency, and as a member of the media, I say Hillary Clinton should have more press conferences as a campaign strategy for the Trump campaign, to, as a piece of strategy for the Trump campaign to use. I don't think it makes a difference. Um, as you and I have both worked on magazines, we know that there are a lot of editors who do absolutely nothing but are listed on mastheads anyway. That is what the Clinton campaign is saying about Huma Abedin being an assistant editor of this Muslim journal. Her mother, however, is the editor-in-chief. This magazine said things that were directly in opposition to Hillary Clinton and a lot of the values that a lot of Democratic voters share, a lot of American voters share. Um, and I think that could be a potential problem for the Clinton campaign. But I think the biggest hole they need to fill quickly is around the Clinton Foundation. This has been something that has been teed up for years. The fact that the Clinton campaign is still taking those foreign donations at this point seems highly questionable as a piece of strategy. Right. All right. So I'm going to try to do them one by one also. Um, Hillary Clinton should have press conferences. Yes, she it's, should. It's important. Do American voters it, care? I, but it is important to Democratic accountability. Hillary Clinton should have press conferences. 260 days without a press conference is bad. Yeah. In the same way that Donald Trump should release his tax returns, sure. I will say yes. again for the hundredth time on this show. Um, you know, I, I believe I'm called the managing editor of Bloomberg Politics. And, and that I, actually means nothing. And I, and I manage nothing <laughs> and edit no one. So there's that. Um, and I don't think that many voters who are in the middle of the electorate care about whom Abedin one way or the other. I'm sorry to say. I know people on the right will hate me for saying that, but I think it's true. The Clinton Foundation is a huge problem. And it's a problem because we, in our last Bloomberg Politics poll, you got 53% of people in the country who think that the fact that the foundation accepts foreign donations is problematic. That's a number that starts to get into the area only area I care about anymore, which is actually persuadable voters, people out there who are not already committed to Donald Trump or already committed to Hillary Clinton, and importantly to a set of voters who are, I think, another interesting subset, which is the subset that is not deciding between Clinton and Trump, but is deciding whether they're going to pull the lever for Hillary Clinton as they normally would for a Democrat, or pull the leather for Donald Trump as they normally would for a Republican. I think there are a lot of Democrats who are, un who are unsettled by the Clinton Foundation, and they have not cleaned this up the way they have handled it today, and the fact they're scrambling around suggests that they recognize a vulnerability in that area. We didn't even get to talk about the 15,000 emails. No, we did not. But Maybe. Let's do that tomorrow. We'll talk about <laughs> the something emails. Something tells me we'll be talking about it more this the week. The emails never go away. Um, campaign fundraising tallies for July came out this weekend. And at first glance, it was an impressive haul for Donald J. Trump billionaire. Last month, setting a new personal record, the Republican nominee raised $36 million, spent only $18 million, and has about $38 million bucks still in the bank. He also loaned his campaign $2 million. But instead of investing that cash into the TV ad war and operational ground game, most of Trump's spending went toward a firm that handles digital ads as well as merch, travel, and reimbursing Trump-owned companies for campaign expenses. All right, now compare that to Hillary Clinton, who last month raised $51 million for her campaign, spent $36 million, and has $58 million in cash on hand. And as Trump rolls out his first general election ad, Hillary Clinton's campaign has reportedly reserved $80 million worth of television airtime in battleground states this fall, which will include spots like the one that the campaign released today that once again uses Donald Trump's own words against himself. In times of crisis, America depends on steady leadership. Knock the crap out of him, would you? Seriously. Clear thinking. I know more about ISIS than the generals do, believe me. And calm judgment. And you can tell them to go themselves. Because all it takes is one wrong move. I would bomb the shit out of them. Just one. I like that sound of that jet taken off there. or I like the long beeps. Or maybe a missile being <laughs> launched. I don't know what. All right, so Alex, here's the question. Um, you, as a matter just of like of campaign mechanics, right? You have these two campaigns. The Trump campaign now looks more like an actual campaign mm -hmm. than it has before, just in terms of its finances. Um, there's some exceptions to that. But as we head into the traditional start of the general election, Labor Day, where do these campaigns stand relative to each other? Look, I mean, this is the question we've been asking. How much do the sort of the the, 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 the traditional levers of a campaign matter? How much do they pull? How much weight do they pull at the, in this in this cycle? I think Trump, Donald Trump needs to run ads. I think spending your money on venues and planes and hats does not win you the American presidency. However, there's a really interesting article in the Times today by Nick Convasori that also talks about the outside spending groups, and that is where you see a dramatic difference between these two campaigns. Nick Convasori, one of the reporters 
reporters who wrote the piece, says basically that Trump is running a pre-Citizens United campaign. Right. Hillary Clinton is running a post-Citizens United right. campaign. That matters. If you look at the spending uh, totals to date, Priorities USA, which is the Clinton super PAC, $131 million. Make the Great America PAC, which is effectively Donald Trump, $12.1 million to date. That is a major difference right. I'll tell you about. I'll tell you about the other piece of that, which is that the Priorities USA have Priorities USA has still has nearly $40 million cash on hand today, still like holding with, it. With 40 million odd pledged in addition to right. that. So, look, I think there's no question that the Clinton campaign is in a better state as, a, as an operation. I don't think anybody in the world would disagree with that. They are better, they have ground operations, they have uh, targeting operations, they're using data in a sophisticated modern way, they're on the air, all that stuff is true. It is, continues to be surprising to me that although it is unquestionably true that, that, that Clinton has established a real lead nationally and in a lot of battleground states, that Trump is still in a lot of places within striking distance and that he now is raising money to put him in a position to close that gap. But to close that gap will require big changes on the part of the candidate and actually doing more with that money to make him look that is like normal campaign operational stuff. Although the hats will be collectors. Items. The hats, the hats are, the hats are special. All right, when we come back, I don't own one though. One day, you just put out the plea publicly. <laughs> can right, you well, send him a hat? And the man, give, the, can you give the brother a hat. Uh, when we come back, we'll have Donald Trump's TBD immigration plan right after this quick break.